Welcome back to the 21 Convention 2018 in Orlando, Florida. I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, obviously, throughout the duration of the conference, we've heard a lot about how masculinity relates to our relationships with women. But our next speaker is someone who talks about it in a much deeper and more tribal context. He is a barbarian. He is someone who walks what he preaches. Uh, it's interesting to me because I know that he wouldn't want anything to do with this, but my own personal opinion is that in a hundred years from now, we'll be reading about this man in history books and what he has done to help revitalize masculinity, even though he wants nothing to do with any of that. He just wants to build his own gang and be left alone. He is the author of The Way of Men, <laughs> Becoming a Barbarian, and his latest book, A More Complete Beast. Please welcome Jack Donovan. All right, last year at 21, my speech was titled A More Complete Beast. I developed that speech into a book and uh, released it about a couple months ago. I talked about overcoming resentment and anger and hatred and focusing on a more creative path. You know, we don't live in a time where men need to be men. We aren't forced by circumstances to become better at being men. No one needs us to be stronger or more courageous or more adept. No one even wants us to have anything approaching honor. Our world is fairly safe. We don't have to hunt for our food. As I said in the book, masculinity is a hammer seeking a nail in a house that's already been built. So if you want to be good at being a man today, it's because you believe that being good at being a man is better. You're doing it for you, to be the best version of you that you can be. If you're here, if you're watching this, you're on a path of self-creation and recreation. You're creating a better version of yourself. You're taking what life has given you and creating a better man from it. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some ideas that I think will help you along that path of self-creation. And these ideas are captured by an ancient symbol, the Ouroboros. And I'm going to give you a little background first, and then we're going to talk about some ways that we can apply this kind of ancient concept of the snake eating its own tail as you create your own life. In the tomb of Tutankhamun, inscribed on the second shrine encasing the boy king's famous sarcophagus, there is a version of the book of Amtuat, a guide to the underworld. This book tells the story of the sun god Ra and his evening descent into the realm of night, told hour by hour. Ra travels across this harrowing world of water and sand to unite with either his own soul or Osiris, the god of the dead. This unification initiates his regeneration. He rises, overcomes Apophis, the Egyptian god of chaos, and then begins his journey toward the dawn and the rebirth of his solar reign. On the version of the book inscribed in Ting Tut's tomb, at the moment of Unification and renewal. The sun god is protected by a serpent, shown in a circular position, with its tail in its mouth. This snake god is Mayan, and this circular, self-consuming orientation is the first recognized representation of the symbol known as the Ouroboros. This symbol recurs again and again throughout Greek and Western magical and alchemical and religious traditions. In an early alchemical drawing, the snake that feeds on itself forever is found encircling the words, the all is one.
The Ouroboros is linked to alchemy again and again, specifically in relation to the great work. The magnum opus, the production of the Philosopher's Stone. The Philosopher's Stone was a substance, or perhaps even a concept, that could turn both base metals into gold and perhaps produce the elixir of life. The elixir of life was believed to be the key to rejuvenation and immortal life. In Germanic lore, the Ouroboros can be recognized as Jormungand, the sea serpent that encircles the world, bound to itself, almost holding the world together. Because when the snake releases its tail from its mouth, it's a sign that the age is coming to an end and that gods and men will meet their final destiny. Carl Jung studied the symbols of alchemists and the lore of folklore of many peoples. He saw these recurring symbols as keys to the unconscious or subconscious mind of men. He wrote that the Ouroboros is a dramatic symbol for the integration and assimilation of the opposite, i.e. the shadow. This feedback process is at the same time a symbol of immortality, since it is said of the Ouroboros that he slays himself and brings himself to life, fertilizes himself, and gives birth to himself. Now, symbols mean what they mean historically, and they also mean you know, take all the meaning that we choose to give to them. Symbols are quick references. They're like logos and trademarks, almost even acronyms. They are compact devices, semiotic devices, that allow us to communicate effectively and efficiently to those in the know about a much bigger and more complicated concept. So today I'm going to use this esoteric alchemical symbol to talk about ways to change the way that you think about time and training and the great work of creating your life. I'm going to start with the body, and then I'm going to build out from there. I started uh, thinking about the Ouroboros, uh, maybe oddly, uh, since it's so esoteric or whatever. Uh, but really, I'm just a dude bro, juice, uh, <laughs> dude bro uh, douchebag at heart. I just want to go to the gym and be left alone. Um, and so I think about things in terms of lifting maybe first. And uh, I started thinking about the Ouroboros because of this question that I get all the time. And I talked to a couple of the trainers here to, uh, over this weekend, and they all get this question too. It's kind of the basic bro question that like, dude, what's your workout like? You know, wh wh what workout do I do to look like that? And, uh, you know, people who have been conditioned, especially in the realm of fitness, to look for the one program to rule them all. They're looking for a magic answer, and the answer is magic. But it's not linear or simple. The answer is a mystery because there actually is no one answer. The answer is a series of strategies employed cyclically and artfully over time. This answer generally involves experimentation and inspiration. And you know, I talked to Tanner Guzzi about this uh, earlier this weekend, and the same thing actually applies to personal style. You know, there is no one answer that is always going to be right. So instead of asking the simple linear question, approach the problem with cyclical thinking. It's not just that it is a process, because people say that all the time, it's a process. It's th the most advanced results actually require a series of processes. You know, elite athletes didn't start at A and keep repeating the same thing over and over and over and over and over again until they got to B. You know, if you think about uh, Olympic athletes at the Olympics, a uh, bodybuilder the day of the show, they're in a state that they can only maintain for, you know, a few hours. Uh, you know, I've trained a lot with powerlifters. And, uh, you know, what they lift on that day of the meet when they get that record that everybody gets excited about, they maybe couldn't lift that two weeks prior or two weeks after that. Uh, they're on a long training cycle, and that's a peaking day, and sometimes they don't get it right, and they were stronger two weeks before the meet, and then they fail their lift. Uh, you know, a fighter, the day of his fight, you know, is that guy always as good as he is that day? No. He did a long fight camp uh, to get ready for that fight with a weight cut and all kinds of things involved with that. You know, so all these things that we see that are exemplars, these goals that we want to get to, they are peaks in cycles. They aren't static states. 
These guys aren't at that place all the time. You know, they, trainers look at things in terms of uh, macro cycles and mesocycles and micro cycles. Cycles of work and recovery, bulking and cutting, chemical cycles, nutritional cycles, cycles of preparation and evaluation, of learning and reflection. You know, to reach a peak state, to even reach a level of initiation at which you can conceive of how to reach a peak state, requires a lot of trial, trial and error. A lot of running this program and that program, and this exercise and that exercise, and finding out what works and what doesn't, and what produces the most best, you know, the best and most reliable results for you. Understanding what works for you and when, you know, is the point at which this, this art and mastery becomes your science. And even the science may change over time. It must be continually challenged, because sometimes what works stops working. And uh, what works right now could be replaced by something that works a little bit better. You know, even with the best advice, progress is not guaranteed to be strictly linear. And it can't be, because there is no real end. You, know, you don't just get there and stay there, no matter what you're doing. You know, only points, you know, moments, benchmarks. There'll be a series of ends and goals and victories, but there'll also be tangents and discoveries and unforeseen obstacles. You know, sickness, injuries, changes in trainers, gyms that open and close, the rules could change, or some future version of yourself you may see a new opportunity, or a different way you want to go, or a new goal. And that moves you in a different direction, closing doors and opening others. You know, nothing stays exactly the same. As you receive new input and your environment changes, your training will change and you will change. Uh, one of my prospects for my group, uh, we'll call him Pork Chop. Uh, when I gave him his prospect patch uh, for a group, and it's a long process that they have to go through, and he had some physical goals because he was already really smart and, and uh, you know, he had a lot of things going for him. Uh, I said to him, at the end of this process, you can't even imagine what you will want then, because you will be a different person. You know, the, the you that you are right now is going to change so much that what you think you want for your long-term future now is going to change completely. You know, and you can apply this not only to training, obviously, but to all aspects of life. You know, like the Ouroboros, the snake that consumes and regenerates itself, you feed on and internalize your past, your experiences. And you adapt and create new manifestations of yourself. You know, based on who I've been and what I've seen, what can I do now? And who will I become next? You know, contemplating these cycles, these loops, brought to mind the work of uh, fighter pilot uh, John Boyd, who's best known for his develop of, development of the OODA loop. Um, as you can see, you know, this is a decision-making loop that everybody goes through. Uh, he does, he uh, you know, came up with it for dogfighting and, uh, you know, military operations and strategy, but it applies to everything. You know, you go through this uh, process where you observe, you know, what's out there, what's our mission, what, what are we go doing. Uh, you orient yourself, you know, based on, like, you know, your previous experiences, uh, you know, everything you've learned in the past, your, your cultural traditions, your background. And then uh, based on you know, what your observations are and what you need to do, you, know, you just decide, you make a decision about a direction to go, and then you act, and that action is a test. And then based on you know, the results of that test, you go back to the beginning. What am I doing next? And uh, you know, if someone's fighting or they're you know, engaged in an you know, airplane dogfight or whatever, that loop happens really, really, really fast. And they teach that in a lot of self-defense courses. Um, and uh, what he's famous for is actually, uh, you know, suggesting, you know, what you really need to do is uh, create chaos in somebody else's OODA loop, and uh, kind of disrupt it and do enough, put enough chaos in their system that they don't know what's going on anymore, and then you can kind of get around them and, and take take an advantage. But uh, you know, it's also a good way to conceptualize and you know evaluate your own decision making process, whether you're talking about training 
whether you're talking about business, you know, you, you make a decision, business decision, what happened, you know, based on that, what, what should be your next step? Now, what, what's perhaps even more relevant here is an essay that John Boyd wrote in 1976 titled uh, Destruction and Creation. And you can find that online somewhere if you look really hard. He wrote, our basic aim is to improve our capacity for independent action. Now, to survive and thrive in a changing environment, we have to form mental concepts of observed reality so that we can make critical decisions about how to proceed. And the goal of this essay was to try and establish a model or a framework for making those kinds of decisions. As our reality changes, we have to keep going through a destructive process of taking our perception of reality, taking it apart, and reconfiguring it, and recreating it to assimilate new information. So I kind of looked at some of the concepts he talked about in the, this uh, essay. And uh, you know, on the destruction side of things, as you're you know, dealing with new information, there's chaos in the system, uh, you know, that's deduction. You're, you're breaking information down from general to specific. You know, you're differentiating things like what makes, you know, what's the ultimate uh, essence of this? I mean, that's kind of what I did when I wrote The Way of Men. You know, like differentiating, breaking down what, what, what belongs in here, what doesn't belong in here, what things go together. You're identifying, you're analyzing. Uh, if you read my most recent book, uh, More Complete Beast, I talk a little bit at the end about uh, Nietzsche and uh, Dionysian versus Apollonian uh, thinking and aspects of life. And this is the kind of the Dionysian, the destructive, destructive phase. And uh, in uh, terms of alchemy, this is a solve. Um, and in, in the creation stage, you're doing inductive reasoning. You're involved in synthesis. You're moving from specific to general. You're finding these concepts and putting them back together again. Integrating them into a new whole or an overarching theory. You know, this is the Apollonian phase, and in terms of alchemy, this is called coagulum. So to understand our reality, we are always taking things apart, looking at the pieces and putting them back together to evolve our understanding. This is true whether you're talking about training or business or life. We're always breaking things down and putting them back together to shape a new reality. In terms of self-analysis, we're always, or we always should be, examining ourselves, internalizing our experiences, and creating new self-evolved concepts. Who are you now? And who do you have to become to continue to thrive and improve your capacity for independent action? In the words of Boyd, the process of structure, unstructure, restructure, unstructure, is repeated endlessly in moving to higher and broader levels of elaboration. Higher and broader levels of elaboration. I love that. I mean, isn't that what we're trying to do as men and as humans? Continually become what we are, challenge and expand our potential, reach broader levels of elaboration of the self. Boyd also made a point that rigid systems break more easily. When your approach to anything is too rigid, when your perception is too closed down, your perception tends to become increasingly wrong because it isn't incorporating and adapting to new information. And actually in the essay, it's, you know, if you are a math guy or whatever, he, uh, he gets into the, he applies the law of, uh, second law of thermodynamics to it and a bunch of actually mathematical theories to prove why this is true. You, know, you have to keep taking in new information and allowing it to disrupt your system. You have to let a little chaos in the system and then synthesize it and incorporate it. And this conference is actually a great uh, example of how to do that. Uh, personally, I, I just moved to a small town uh, that's, uh, you know, 13,000 people. No one does anything there except for maybe, like, play video games and maybe they do math. And, uh, 
you know, there's just nothing going on. And it's very, you know, I can just sit alone in my office all day. And, uh, you know, coming to a conference like this, uh, you know, I get to have different influences, to talk to different kinds of people, and, uh, you know, have things that I wasn't expecting here. Because you can, you can sit in a room and uh, direct your own research. Like, uh, you know, I want to listen to very specific, you know, kinds of ideas, and these ideas are connected to other ideas that I'm interested in and so forth. And you can curate your personal fee of information. But uh, when you come to a thing like this, you're allowing a little chaos into the system. You're talking to people, and they're suggesting ideas to you that you weren't looking for, necessarily. And uh, this is kind of what I'm talking about. You have to let that into the system every so often, and it's part of the growth process. And then you, know, you walk away from something like this, and uh, you incorporate that and synthesize this into your new, uh, you know, the new version of yourself that is going to go forward. You know, returning to uh, alchemy for a moment. Carl Jung wrote, there we go, that the alchemist saw the essence of his art in separation and analysis on one hand, and th synthesis and consolidation on the other. For him, there was first of all an initial state in which opposite tendencies or forces were in conflict. Secondly, there was the great question of a procedure which would be capable of bringing the hostile elements and qualities once they were separated, back to unity again. The initial state, named chaos, was not given from the start, but had to be sought for as the prima materia. And just as the beginning of the work was not self-evident, so to an even greater degree was its end. And that brings me to the final point that I wanted to make that I think is captured by the Ouroboros. This snake that consumes and creates itself over and over. When you think in linear terms, you are oriented toward an end. But there is no end. You know, the only really end is death. And you know, most people may not even realize the moment that they die. So for you, in terms of your perception, it never ends. You know, it may never end. So, you know, what happens when you reach your goal? You know, because if you only think linearly, you're going toward a goal, and then, you know, when you get to that goal, what happens? You know, what then? You don't just stop. You internalize that victory or defeat, and you look for the next goal, the next elaboration of the self, the next victory. You know, men of this age is this empire of nothing have been trained to work for the end. You know, the weekend, the end of work, the end of life. Like prisoners who have been promised an hour in the yard. Men have been promised that in return for five days of work, they will be released from their employment to enjoy two days of free time. You know, at work, they do what the company wants them to do and take care not to say anything that you know, the company has deemed inappropriate. During these two days, celebrated in America as the weekend, working men are encouraged to relax. They are free to be who they really are. Through increasingly, you know, though increasingly, even in this time, is monitored by, uh, you know, employers, you know, who are going to look and scan you know, all your profiles and things for possible signs of undesirable habits or viewpoints. I think maybe many of you are aware of that. You know, workers describe themselves by listing the kind of leisure activities that they prefer, as well as the foods, beverages, entertainment products that they choose, the things that they consume in the time that they are permitted to relax. Their identities, their very lives, are defined almost entirely by their recreational choices by their likes. You know, beyond the weekend, men have been taught to work for vacations and eventually retirement. The big weekend, granted to workers when they have reached the end of their useful lives. You know, a lot of religions are oriented this way as well. You know, I never understood what you were supposed to do in heaven anyway. Uh, isn't it a pleasant white blank? A softly lit question mark? An eternal happiness and stasis? 
a measured, consistent drip of your favorite endorphins. You know, those who view life as suffering see death as a reward, a forever weekend, a time when they can finally relax and end the suffering of living. The spirit of this age, this, you know, this is the linear struggle to blank, is what I call it. This is my broken downtown where I live. And there, there happened to be a sign that said recreation there. Uh, so I have to get that. You know, men have been trained to struggle to an end. And at the end, they are permitted to relax. The word relax actually comes from a root that means to loosen. And in this struggle to relax, a man merely seeks a little slack in his bondage and a break from his chores. Recreation is the reward for work. You know, to be a great man, to be a self-creator, a self-master, what I referred to in my last book as a noble beast, you need to stop thinking about recreation and start thinking about recreation. You know, a great man's recreational preferences are the least interesting thing about him. What kind of wine did Caesar drink? Nobody cares. You know, it's trivia, a tiny forgettable detail set against the grand story of his life. The master creates. He is known by his works, not his pastimes, not his likes. His life is not suffering. You know, the noble beast is glad to be alive. He's glad to be able to exert his strength and his will and intellect. He is pleased to be able to continue to create again and again. The noble beast doesn't want to relax. He just wants to keep becoming, to keep making himself anew. And I started thinking about this, you know, talking to a young guy who has mentoring. And you know, we were always working on projects and he was always like waiting for the end. I'm like, when are you gonna get stop waiting for the end and realize that there's always more to do? You know, I think I think the people who are really driving businesses and, and so forth in this world are like, they're always looking for the next thing. They're not like, ah, finally we get to be done. And uh, you know, I think that's a difference between kind of winners and, and slaves, really. Yeah. You know, when a man is forced to work. He looks forward to the slackening of bonds and a break from the whip. When a man forces himself to work, he works to realize a vision. But during the process, more visions re reveal themselves to him. You know, so he finds himself not working toward an end of work, but toward the next beginning to get to what's next. I can't wait to get to the projects get done with this conference, and get to this party I have to host in a couple weeks, and then I get to plan the next thing that I'm working on in my life. And that's what I'm really excited about. So don't struggle to get to the end so that you can relax. That's for slaves. Struggle to get to the next struggle. Because as a self-creator, your great work your magnum opus, the great work of creating your life, keeps going until you die. The creative man is a self-turning wheel, a self-consuming serpent, an Ouroboros, gnawing away at his own flesh to feed his own growth. The creative beast seeks no end. He consumes the end over and over in a continual process of regeneration and becoming. He digests life inch by inch, and with childlike exuberance, he says yes to himself and chews ever forward. <laughs> Okay, I'm open up, up to questions.
Great talk, Jack. Um, question that I have is, uh, I've always been like an avid reader. That's how I stumbled on the red pill. I have a like never ending thirst for knowledge. Mm -hmm. And one of the first questions I asked at the conference is that I, I do want to be a father one day. Um, I don't know if you're a father or not. No. Okay. So one of the fears I have, it's kind of like a mixture. Like I, I do want to be a father, but I know that kids, you know, they, they do take away from your, your time to, um, develop yourself because obviously you have to be there for your kids you can't you know neglect your kids mm -hmm. so how do you how do you process that I don't know if you ever desire to become a father but are, are they kind of mutually exclusive to you or are they is it something you ever thought about how you would integrate that like in other words not letting your self-development miss a miss a beat because you have kids because obviously we're no good to our kids as fathers if we stunt our growth as men yeah uh, I mean, the advice that I would give someone personally, I mean, I've, I've certainly thought about it mm -hmm. uh, myself. And, and now I feel really comfortable with it. Like, you know, if it happened, I could deal with it. You know, I could deal with it and work it in because I've done a lot of things in my life that I'm already proud of. And so I have a base to move from. I think where that really becomes a problem is maybe for like really young guys who mm -hmm. they get kind of trapped really quick because they don't really have the resources to deal with that uh, problem. So, I mean, I personally... I, I think men should wait a little bit, sure. maybe till they're like a little bit thirty. You know, and then you can date a woman that's much younger. But uh, you know, yeah. the wait, you know, it gets to the point where maybe they're a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when, you know, I think you know, getting to the point where you're established and you just have more to offer, and I think you have a better selection at that point. And you know, men kind of age, you know, like wine or whatever, yeah. so that it's better. Okay, uh, but yeah, that's Thank that's you. what. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to switch from a uh, practical question to a philosophical question. Is there any place, or what is the place of humility in your worldview? Humility? Um, I, I think, especially with training and things like that, I, I'm, I have a lot of humility. Uh, I, I, when I started going down this path myself, I mean, I was already like 38 years old. And so like when I go to a new martial arts class or something like that, uh, yeah, I never really expect to be that good. You know, I don't have this like huge ego that like an 18 year old has that they're uh, like, I'm going to immediately be the best person ever. I'm just there to learn. I'm just there to get better. And uh, so I approach a lot of things that way. And I think that that's, in terms of learning, that's the best way to approach things. I think humility is, is good, you know. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Donovan. Mm -hmm. um, my question would be, what would be the promise for men to produce a alchemical change within themselves? Hmm. I mean, it just depends, I think, perfect example of what we're talking about because there is no one answer. <laughs> uh, you have to look at the bigger picture, like what exactly, what, what alchemical change are you, uh, you know, trying to produce in yourself? I mean, what are you trying to bring about? And, uh, you know, what are the processes that will best get you there? And I think that that's, that, that's what you always have to be looking at is what are the, what am I actually trying to achieve? And then orient things about, you know, the philosophical, you know, the telos, like what is the end? Where are you going? And uh, I think you need to orient things around that. And a lot of people, you know, orient themselves around, you know, maybe the process instead. And you, I think you need to like, you know, pick a spot, head that way, and then realize the spot might change. Thank you so much, sir. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jack, for your um, presentation. Mm -hmm. What are a couple of concrete things that you would recommend to men who are looking to forge a brotherhood with other men who are interested in their self-development uh, and whose self-development you are interested in as friends of virtue uh, in the context of that being somewhat a rare thing in this day and age? It's, it's really hard. I mean, I, I obviously have the advantage of maybe being a lightning rod for stuff like that. So people reach out to me and talk to me about things like that. But even geographically, I'm not in a great place for it. Uh, so, I mean, I think if I went to Texas, I'm, <laughs> I, could, I could start some stuff. But uh, <laughs> I, I think that, uh, you know, you have to, you know, find like-minded guys. A lot of guys are looking for something similar. And uh, it is hard to build a kind of relationship in the real world where you can hold each other accountable. I mean, personally, I believe, and I, I've said this before, I think uh, oaths, like fraternal brotherhoods and things like that, 
Uh, you know, there's a lot of guys who are like, well, yeah, I know he's got my back and I've got his. And you actually really don't know that. You know, a lot of times, like, it's just a feeling maybe that you have. And, you know, sometimes you do, you know, you have a good sense of that and sometimes you don't. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, but if you have some kind of, where you've acknowledged a shared purpose, I because I think men are actually really, you know, it's part of the honor hardwiring that we have uh, to, you know, once I've said something, my word is my bond, and that actually means something. And so, you know, they will, they will knock themselves out to, you know, uh, adhere to that or do elaborate ways of finding a way to get, or get around it. But, uh, uh, you know, I think men will really, really orient themselves uh, uh, around their words. And, and, and if they've made an actual pact, um, you know, that's, that means something. So I think that, you know, it's hard to get people to that place, but I think to really get that kind of accountability that you need in terms of like pushing each other, um, you know, in the long term, that's actually really helpful. Um, but uh, in the short term, you know, it's like what everybody says, you know, surround yourself with people who are successful. And, uh, you know, if you keep feeding, I think with relationships too, I mean, any relationship, uh, what are you giving it has to be constantly your question. That you're asking like, well, what am I giving to this and what am I giving back? And, uh, you know, so a lot of people approach, you know, you know, someone who's successful and they kind of just go to them looking for answers and for them to keep giving them. And uh, you have to approach somebody with something that you're willing to give as well. There has to be reciprocation always, I think. Hey, so you mentioned you want to struggle on to the next struggle. Don't struggle to find the relaxation. Yep. And uh, I understand that it speaks to me, but my question is going to be, uh, it's important for me to take trips, to take travels, to experience other cultures. Where do you classify that? Do you take trips? Like, where do you fit in? I, I almost don't want to say the relaxation of the vacation, but that's kind of what it is. Where do you fit that into this? I mean, actually, uh, I actually think that that's part of the, the struggle, the struggle. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I can't see myself just going somewhere to sit on a beach and just whatever. I mean, I, to me, I would, there would have to be a purpose involved. Like, you know, I went to Germany like three times in the past two years and I went once to give a speech. And then, you know, second time I brought my, you know, uh, was more of a vacation the second time, but I'm still shooting pictures. I'm still making content for Instagram. I'm doing all this stuff. And, uh, you know, the third time was, you know, for another event, but I also brought my photographer with me and we went to spots that were specifically related to things that I'm trying to do. Uh, so personally, when I envision vacations and travel, it's always about, you know, something that I want to accomplish. I mean, uh, the, putting yourself into a new environment is actually a really good way to like in, induce that chaos into the system. You know, like going to a foreign country for the first time, like, you know, that's a whole new thing that you have to deal with and you're getting all kinds of new input that you weren't getting before. And uh, so, I mean, I've been thinking about that in terms of myself uh, recently. It's like, uh, you know, if I'm in this small town and uh, I need that kind of input, well, maybe what I'm going to start doing is uh, going to more like, you know, two weeks intensive training of this or, you know, traveling to get get a real experience and, and really learn something. And so that, that's where I would classify it, really. I mean, everybody needs downtime, but I think as, you know, especially if you're self-employed like I am, uh, you know, you have your downtime is kind of when you pick it. You're not working for your downtime. You're like, well, I'm going to do this today because <laughs> I feel like it, you know. And that's and everybody has to do that, but I, I don't think that should be the focus of your life. And that was kind of the, the point that I was trying to make is like the focus shouldn't be for the vacation; it should be towards greater work. Um, a recurring theme that I'm like getting, like uh, Mr. Swift said it, and Eric Bonsaito said it, um, kind of like when you pass the warrior phase and you turn into like an elder. Yeah. Um, and I'm and I'm listening to you in the previous question talking about the other gentleman about children like you need resources you kind of have to get into that other stage before you can take on that responsibility mm -hmm. and my question is about uh, for brotherhood if you are like I'm a younger man um, what do I have to offer like the brotherhood like if I if I'm looking for mentorship from elders right they have a lot of resources um, I have like a lot of energy but what what obviously that's to be reciprocation like you just said mm -hmm. so what exactly would I be able to offer like them to be able to mentor me? Work. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, that's why people have interns, right? I mean, like, yeah, work. And uh, obviously, if you can find some other ways, make yourself available. I mean, I, like, you know, people who, uh, you know, 
become part of my group recently. It's like, I think in any company, and you know, I learned this when I was actually working in, in the business world and, and so forth, uh, you know, you're trying to, you know, justify your existence always. Uh, you know, trying to like take on, uh, you know, I had, I had a manager who was always trying to take on new responsibilities, you know, because she saw other things she was doing getting phased out. And uh, so you always want to take on new responsibilities so you can keep justifying your existence. And so like, uh, you know, like uh, the photography thing was actually a good example. Like I, you know, I had, uh, you know, someone working with me who, uh, you know, that was a way that they could add value. I'm like, I need someone who can take pictures. Here's some, you know, I'll pay for you to take classes so that you can take some pictures because that's what I need. Uh, and then, you know, that's a way that you can provide value. So you always really have to be looking for ways to, to provide value, I think. Got it. Thank you. Cool. Hello. Thank you, Jack, for your uh, speech, a great speech. And um, I have a question regarding um, all your comments. How can men, we uh, uh, fight or emasculation that is going on in our society and in our homes? Because there is a war against men, against masculinity. And uh, there is one of the shirts that is being sold uh, where a slogan in the back, uh, if you wear in certain places, they will shoot you. <laughs> right, well, I, say. And, uh, I, I think Yeah, your comments really about loud. it, yeah, yeah, that would yeah. be, I would appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, um, you know, it's a tough one because, you know, the problem that I ran into, and I stopped doing this a few years ago because I went through my, I feel like I put in my time on that particular fight. Um, I did a lot of reading of feminism, and, and uh, you know I, I wrote a really long response to it, which I have uh, online for free. And the arguments haven't changed; they haven't changed in 30 or 40 years. Uh, they just, you know, like masculinity is a mask. Well, that's that comes from like the 70s. They, that's not new. They've been saying they are a broken record over and over again. So I feel like you know once you know the background of it, if you have a little bit of the background, you can respond to it better. But you know, I, I always like the the quote. Uh, I think it's from Putin that says like I try never to argue with women and uh, that that's that's kind of where I'm at uh, you know like I, I don't want to spend my life and I feel like that's the trap that we get stuck in with society is that uh, you know there there are you know a handful of women in New York and DC and LA who uh, you know they're just complete sociopaths and they they, they work for these uh, newspapers and they're just terrible people and uh, they're basically just you know, provocateurs. And so they put out this content, and I don't even know if they believe half of it, or maybe they just believe it at the moment that they were typing it or whatever. And uh, you know, the, the latest outrage, like you, know, I, you always see it come up in your feed. I try to not follow people who put it up there, but because uh, I don't want to see that anymore. But uh, you know, the latest outrage, the latest dumb thing some feminist said that doesn't make any sense and is obviously wrong, uh, it, it gets to a point where they are you know, calling the tune and we're dancing to it. And you know, so, okay, well, they said something crazy, now we respond. Now they say something crazy and they respond. They're leading. And I think that that's a problem. And I think that uh, the challenge for men, if they're going to create a different narrative, is not to keep responding to them all the time, but to create a different, you know, a different narrative that goes over that and is, is separate from it. Because if you're always responding to it, you're, uh, you know, I said in the book, uh, actually, uh, you know, it's, it's like a boxer. You're always like throwing out jabs and moving backwards. Like that's all you're doing. You're not do actually doing anything. You're just like keeping them away. And I feel like that's what the reactionaries do uh, when they keep responding to every crazy thing that feminists say. They're always like throwing out jabs and moving backward and uh, not really getting anything done. And I think that then that was kind of the point of my last book was, you know, uh, focus on creating a new direction rather than responding and moving backward. I appreciate your answer, Jack. Cool. I got a question actually here. Cool. Um, what call to action would you give uh, younger men who are interested in you know, developing tribes? Um, and also, how do you see this tribal element unfolding in the future as the world becomes more and more digital and, you know, as more and more things become globalized and everything. How do you see tribes interacting with this, with these changes? Um, well, you can't go out in the woods and live by yourselves and not interact with anybody. That's not real. Uh, that's, 
you know, you can't just hide from the modern world. I think that if you're actually, you know, I, I always put things in the context of, you know, barbarians at the end of Rome, and, you know, they're just waiting for something. They're just picking off around the corners and as the whole thing's falling down. And I really think that that's what you have to be doing, is like, rather than uh, people get, you know, purist uh, about things, like, you know, I know a lot of people who are very anti-technology and, and whatever, but, uh, you know, I think our ancestors who are winners would have said, use every advantage. And you just, I think that the challenge is not losing who you are in that. But, uh, you know, if you, in terms of creating a tribe, uh, you can't create a tribe that is just like outside of modernity because that's not a thing. You're always, you're, someone's going to have to work and you're going to have to pay taxes and you don't get to, you don't get to leave anymore. That's not, the, you don't get to just go to a desert island and create a special utopia. Uh, but, you know, the more you can carve out something, uh, you know, that has its own identity, uh, I think that's the real challenge. Thank you. All right, guys, let's give it up for Jack Donovan. Thank you. Thank you.